While finding the rational zeros of a polynomial in video 4.5, we talked about the converse of the zero product property and the factor theorem. So instead of finding the zeros of a polynomial, if you're given the zeros, can you find the polynomial? And that's what we're going to do today, write polynomials. There are two other theorems we need to take into account, the irrational conjugates theorem and the complex conjugates theorem. Let f be a polynomial function with rational coefficients, and let a and b be rational numbers such that root b is irrational. If a plus root b is a zero of f, then a minus root b is also a zero of f. Basically, if you have a positive root as a part of one of your zeros and you have rational coefficients, then you have to also have a negative root or the conjugate as a zero because only conjugates rationalize your results. If f is a polynomial function with real coefficients and a plus bi is an imaginary zero of f, then a minus bi is also a zero of f because if one of your zeros has an imaginary part, but the coefficients of the polynomial are all real, then yes, the conjugate must be another zero of this polynomial. Let's review. The conjugate of three minus two root two is three plus two root two. We change the sign in front of the root. The conjugate of three plus two i is three minus two i. We change the sign in front of the imaginary part. Begin by writing a polynomial function f of least degree that has rational coefficients, a leading coefficient of one, and the zeros three and two plus root five. A leading coefficient of one means a is equal to one, a zero of three means x equals three, x equals two plus root five, and if two plus root five is a zero of our polynomial, by the irrational conjugates theorem, two minus root five must also be a zero. The factor theorem states a polynomial f of x has a factor x minus k if and only if f of k equals zero. Each of these zeros is a value of k, making their corresponding factors x minus k. Now the converse of the zero product property would state that if each of these expressions is equal to zero, then multiplying these expressions by each other will also be equal to zero. I'm going to distribute this negative one to remove the parentheses within these bigger bracket groups. Now you may not be able to see it, but here, we have difference of perfect squares. See how we have a minus b times a plus b? Just because a is a group doesn't mean we don't have perfect squares here. And in this case, we recognize that a is x minus two and b is root five. Multiplying the difference of perfect squares results in a squared minus b squared. If a is x minus two, then we have a squared and b is root five but that should also be squared and the sign in between is minus simplify from here root five squared is just five because the square and root are inverse operations after simplifying we have this binomial times a trinomial now you may have wondered what did we do with a equals one, our leading coefficient? Well, that whole time, if they give you a leading coefficient, that leading coefficient needs to be multiplied in front of these factors. But we don't have to write that because one times anything is itself. Now distribute. Here is your polynomial equation. Now it's time to write it as a polynomial function f. To check our work, we can plug in each of the zeros into the polynomial to see if we get zero. Now, 
and we can use binomial expansion to check these quantities. Continue to simplify. We can expand this root 5 cubed to be root 5 times root 5 times root 5. Root 5 times root 5 is just 5, so this would be 5 root 5. And once you combine like terms, you get zero. That was definitely a fair amount of algebra for that check. Thankfully, because of the irrational conjugates theorem, if 2 plus root 5 is a zero, then 2 minus root 5 is a zero. And we don't need to also check that one. But now we know for sure that this is our solution. For number two, write a polynomial function f of least degree that has real coefficients, a leading coefficient of one, and the zeros two and three plus i. We're gonna do the same process we did for number one, but this time we use the complex conjugates theorem. The complex conjugates theorem states that if three plus i is a zero, then three minus i, its conjugate, is also a zero of f. Now use the factor theorem to rewrite each of these zeros as a factor equal to zero. Because each of these factors is equal to zero, we can set the product of these three factors equal to zero. Remember your leading coefficient is one. It's time to distribute these negative ones so we can regroup and use difference of perfect squares. Now we'll group the x minus 3 and the x minus 3 to show that we have the same first term in each of these bigger groups. This is in the form difference of perfect squares, where a is equal to x minus 3 and b is equal to i. This multiplies to be a squared minus b squared. Now we'll expand this binomial and simplify i squared. Continue to simplify inside of this large bracket. Go ahead and double distribute. This is our polynomial equation, but we were asked to write a polynomial function f, so rewrite this as f of x. We can check if this is our correct polynomial by plugging in the zeros and making sure they make this polynomial equal to zero. All right, f of two is equal to zero. Let's try f of three plus i. Go ahead and expand similarly to how we did it in number one.
Wow, this is so fun. Continue to simplify. Wow, this is so fun. Remember that i squared is negative 1 and i cubed is negative i. Wow, that one also equals zero. And fortunately, by complex conjugates theorem, if three plus i is a zero of a polynomial, then three minus i is also a zero of that polynomial, that polynomial with real coefficients. And now we know for sure that we got the correct polynomial.